it's my pleasure to honor doc to introduce and honor Dr. Joseph Barada. Dr. Barada will be presenting a model from Clark and Sohn, the United Nations, based on a revised, amended, and expanded charter. Their ideas would have moved the UN significantly toward becoming a federal world government. And it remains one of the most significant historical models in the field. Mm. Dr. Barada is one of the foremost historians of the World Federalist Movement and the efforts to strengthen the United Nations. He is Professor Emeritus at Worcester State University and author of the two volume work, The Politics of World Federation. Joseph will be presenting for 40 minutes and then we'll open it up for questions for an additional 15 minutes. Um, be, please put any questions you have in the chat box. You can find the chat at the bottom of the screen just by uh, moving your cursor to uh, below at near the bottom of the zoom the screen and click on chat. Uh, start your question with a question mark so that the CGS staff knows their questions and not just comments to each other. Uh, CGS staff will collate the questions and then I'll ask them um, after Joseph's done with his presentation. Uh, Joseph Drea will be keeping time for us today, and she'll be jumping in at the halfway mark to let you know when you're halfway through your time, and then when you hit the five-minute mark left. Joseph, I'd like to hand the microphone over to you. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Donna. Good evening. Are we set to go? Yep, you're all ready. <clears throat> world Peace Through World Law was the title of a book of 1958 that is generally regarded as a minimalist plan for world government. It was designed to abolish war by substantial amendment of the United Nations Charter. It did not attempt to establish a world government that would be empowered to address all the problems of humanity. Though it pro provided for a more liberal amendment procedure so that its powers could grow. Known as the Clarkstone Plan, it was distinct from the preliminary draft of a world constitution of 1948 by the University of Chicago's Chancellor Robert M. Hutchins, Professor of European Literature Giuseppe Antonio Borghese, and about a dozen academics. They offered a maximalist plan designed to both abolish war and unite the world to achieve justice. Justice was understood by them as rebuilding war torn Europe freeing the peoples abroad in British and other European empires, overcoming racism in America and imprisonment in Russia and addressing poverty almost everywhere. Both plans were distinct from the plan to unite the democracies by Clarence Streit in Union Now of 1939. That was a maximalist plan, but only of the leading democracies. The United States, Canada, Britain, France, Netherlands, and so on, in a desperate effort to head off World War II against fascist Germany, Italy, and Japan. After the war, the Strait Plan tended to align with U.S. containment policy opposed to the undemocratic USSR. Thus, historically, the Clarkstone Plan was very late to respond to the historic opportunity opened up by the Allied victory in the war and by establishment of the weak United Nations organization. But Clark and Sohn was seen as practical and realistic because it was very carefully drafted, a very carefully drafted series of UN Charter amendments in 
designed to achieve universal disarmament and hence peace by the rule of world law. To my mind, the book is still eminently readable. If you want to understand the UN Charter and what it would take to make it effective, this is the plan to read. No other plan from the world, old world Federalist movement can make its objective so clear and persuasive. Hold on a minute. Donna, is there some way we can hear or see Mr. Barada? Yes, if you um, take your um, cursor and put it up in the upper right corner of the Zoom window and, and see the view, you could click side by side speaker. And when he's speaking, you'll see him. Do you see that? No. Uh, shall I continue? Yes, please. please. Renville Clark and Louis B. Sohn, here pictured, were both lawyers, Clark on Wall Street, in the generation of wealthy, progressive public servants that included Elihu Root, Henry Stimson, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Sohn was a poor Polish emigre, Jewish, from Hitler's Europe, who studied with Judge Manley O. Hudson of the World Court when the U.S. was not a party to the League and the Court. Stone rose at Harvard Law School to professor of international law. He became one of a handful of the most highly qualified legal publicists, uh, uh, including Lasse Oppenheim and Hirsch Lauterpacht. They assumed, as Clark said at the beginning of World Peace Through World Law, there is no peace without law. Another time he said, it is almost axiomatic there that there can be no peace without order and no order without law. United World Federalists went even further saying, we believe that peace is not merely the absence of war, but the presence of justice, of law, of order, and short of government and the institutions of government. That world peace can be created and maintained only under a world federal government universal and strong enough to prevent armed conflict between nations and having direct jurisdiction over the individual in those matters within its authority. Clark and Sohn were thoroughly familiar with constitutions, treaties, common and statute law, and they had a plenty of practical experience in government where apart from sovereign conduct, every effort is made to adhere to the rule of law. They understood that they were proposing constitutional legislation. They were drafting a fundamental law for the world. Both had imagined an adequate United Nations as early as the Dumbarton Oaks Conference of 1944 and San Francisco Conference of 1945, based on governing institutions in large multi-ethnic federal states like the United States and the Soviet Union a popularly representative legislature, an executive of the laws, and an independent judiciary supported by allied unity. By 1958, allied unity had been replaced by the Cold War between the liberal democracies and the communist states. So a reformed UN, inclusive of all states, was a long shot but Clark and Sohn still believed that states would find their proposals acceptable if they offered a practical plan to achieve peace, a common interest. States could coexist and compete without the arbiter of war. Clark also was a prominent figure in US government because of his services to the country and his immense wealth 
acquired by practice in the law. Sohn was a leading internationalist at Harvard Law School. Both aimed at a UN charter as a treaty to govern state conduct and ensure the peace. But they went very far as a reader will immediately see. In order to achieve general and complete disarmament, they made the General Assembly democratically representative of the peoples of the world. They made the assembly primarily responsible for the maintenance of peace and security. At a stroke, they abolished the Security Council with its veto. In its place, they made it an executive council of the world laws enacted by the assembly. A careful 10-year stepwise plan would abolish all military forces and ultimately secure a disarmed world by a new world peace force alone equipped with arms. Today, charter amendment is generally considered impossible because it is now subject to the big five veto and is thought politically unwise. For so violent have international relations become that an attempt at systemic amendment would probably produce a weaker charter than the one we now have. On the other hand, charter amendment is perfectly possible and is provided for if there were overwhelming public demand for it. Even overriding the Big Five veto, as in the case of the US Constitution, when it was provided that it would go into effect when ratified by nine of the 13 states and not unanimously as required by the Articles of Confederation. Similarly, the covenant of the League of Nations had no provision for termination, yet it was simply abandoned by the state's members after 1939. Moreover, a reformed UN charter could be made wise if under public demand, enough courageous public servants dared to assemble to make the charter relevant to our changed times. It cannot be that wisdom in America ran out with the founding fathers. Many countries after World War II summoned the wisdom to devise democratic constitutions, notably Italy, Germany, and Japan, and Europe as a whole has formed a union. All depends upon the strength of public opinion. One of the most interesting features of the Clark's own plan was their proposal to create two new organs of the UN, a World Conciliation Board and a World Equity Tribunal. They would settle by law political disputes like the Israeli-Palestinian crisis, which they take up as an explanatory example. These organs would supply what is lacking in the current International Court of Justice, which is limited to legal disputes, like the interpretation of a treaty. The distinction between legal and political matters in international life is heavily weighted toward the political. Whereas in domestic order, most national affairs can be treated in legal institutions. The World Conciliation Board was to consist of five most qualified international mediators or conciliators chosen by the General Assembly. In case of a dispute that cannot be settled by reference to the ICJ, the board should have authority to investigate and recommend a solution within six months, which it would report back to the General Assembly. Then either national courts or regional courts would be empowered to impose a settlement upon individuals by means of houses of detention or fines. In harder cases, a new World Equity Tribunal would be composed of 15 persons 
whose character, experience, and reputation would furnish the best assurance of impartiality and breadth of view. They would be elected for life by the General Assembly as representatives of the principal judicial tribunals and legal associations and of leading academic, scientific, economic, and religious organizations. They would be drawn from a list of nominees by committees in national states. The 15 would have jurisdiction under voluntary agreements or in the hardest cases without regard to agreement of those involved if in the judgment of three fifths of the representatives in the General Assembly, um, uh, the tribunal should go ahead to make a reasonable, just and fair recommendation. That recommendation would then become binding if approved by a four fifths majority of the General Assembly. That would be overwhelming public sentiment, hard for a recalcitrant state to resist. But in the worst case, it would be enforced by economic and military sanctions, ultimately by the UN Peace Force. We have to imagine what this means. The General Assembly in the Carcassonne Plan would be elected by the peoples of the world, voting as individuals in accordance with their judgment of where justice lay, as in national Republican assemblies. They would not be appointees of the state governments under instructions of how to vote as at present. The whole scheme presumes that world democracy on those questions affecting international peace and security. International law was not so developed as to be easily applied by the ICJ. The Security Council would not have the ultimate military powers of the five permanent members as at present, but would be transformed into an executive council for the enforcement of world laws enacted by the General Assembly. Clark and Sohn described this UN reform as the revival of the old English institution of equity. What is equity? In the 14th century, King Edward III found that justice was often frustrated by great lords retaining private armies and intimidating the royal courts. The common law had become encrusted by precedent and was sometimes defeated especially in disputes over land and growing municipal bodies by lawyers doing the magistrates bidding. The king provided that he could do justice in a separate court, which grew into the court of chancery. It provided for no jury, no counsel for the defendant and no right against self-incrimination. It met in a chamber with a ceiling painted blue and studded with gold stars, hence it was called the Star Chamber. Equity was a royal judge's finding of justice, apart from the common law. In the course of time by the Puritan Revolution of the 17th century, the Star Chamber had become a symbol of arbitrary power, but reforms had preserved it and it was carried to America with the common law as law and equity. By analogy, what Clark and Son provided was not that the king's judge in the court of chancery should find justice when the law was inadequate, but that the World Equity Tribunal backed by the gen elected General Assembly should do so. The presumption was that the assembly's representatives would run for office on the basis of their devotion to the global good, not to national interest. They could be trusted to represent humanity. What gave Clark and Sohn confidence that their disarmament plan and world peace through world law 
would be acceptable to nations and their peoples. Since after a brief period of influence under young President John F. Kennedy, it has all come to naught, <clears throat> I ask, does its fate offer light on the political conditions for the success of any massive disarmament plan or even for limited world government? I propose in the remainder of this lecture to examine historically the conditions for ultimate success. I argue that only massive public pressure would produce the necessary amendments. Clark's character is relevant for us, for we will all have to acquire some of it to achieve the universal state reforms we have in mind. Grenville Clark was born in 1882 to an old family that became prominent as bankers and lawyers in Boston and New York. Grenville Clark was much influenced by his maternal grandfather, Colonel Legrand B. Cannon, pioneer railroad financier, Union Army officer, and acquaintance of Abraham Lincoln. Cannon often quoted Lincoln in words that Clark remembered, quote, the people will save their government if the government itself will do its part only indifferently well, unquote. He deeply instilled in the boy the democratic maxims of self-help. Don't wait for the government to act in a crisis, my boy. Let the people take hold when there is need. That is the way this country was built up. Move yourself. After graduation from Harvard Law, Clark briefly worked in the same law office with Franklin Delano Roosevelt before setting up his own office near Wall Street with Elihu Root Jr. In 1915, Elihu Root Sr., former Secretary of State, Secretary of War, and New York Senator, joined the uh, growing Root Clark firm as general counsel. Through the senior man, Clark met Henry Stimson and many of the ablest men in law and government of their generation. This beginning is important for it explains why Grenville Clark all his life preferred to be of service to his country as a private citizen without seeking appointment or election to actual office. For instance, in 1915, Clark became convinced that the United States would inevitably be drawn into the Great War, but the army was unprepared. President Wilson could not act because of the strength of isolationism non-involvement in Europe's quarrels. He was re-elected in 1916 on the slogan, he kept us out of war. So Clark privately organized training camps for American officers at Plattsburgh, New York, across Lake Champlain from Colonel Cannon's estate, where along with additional camps, some 60,000 army officers were trained. They proved invaluable when Wilson brought the United States into the war in 1917. Clark himself was commissioned a major and was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. Joseph, we're also at the halfway point. Then in 1940, when war with Hitler was threatened, Clark became convinced again that the United States could not escape it a military draft would be needed. But President Roosevelt could not act because of the strength of the isolationist tradition embittered because of public, the public sense of betrayal over making the world safe for democracy. Working behind the scenes, rather as he had acted in the Pittsburgh movement, Clark proposed Henry Stimson as Secretary of War. Stimson, former Secretary of State, was known as also favoring a draft law, <clears throat> though he was 73 and a Republican. Then maneuvering among prominent people, including Justice Felix Frankfurter, Clark got Stimson's name before the president. 
He also proposed the younger Robert P. Patterson, formerly of Root Clark, as assistant secretary. Roosevelt supported, appointed Stimson and Patterson, and then in October 1940, before the election, the National War Service Act Selective Service passed. A year later in 1941, the draft law came up for a renewal and it passed by one vote. Throughout the war, Clark worked with Stimson on a general service law, the worker fight bill to limit labor strikes by drafting miners and war industry workers as in similar laws in Britain and the Soviet Union. Roosevelt, however, hesitated to propose it until a State of the Union address in 1945, when war with Japan was feared to last until 1947. Whether such a measure could have hurried the Second Front before 1944, as Stalin demanded, will never be known. Grenville Clark came to be regarded in government circles as a statesman incognito. To the world federalists, he was their elder statesman. Why then did Grenville Clark turn from the works of war to those of peace? For him, there was no inconsistency. He was trying to save the United States. He advocated military preparedness in 1915 and again in 1940 as prudent measures of national defense. In each case, his proposals were radically at variance with the current state of popular and official opinion, but, if, but history has largely proved the wisdom of his course, especially with regard to World War II. By 1944, however, the possibility of a military defense for preserving the life and liberties of the American people seemed deeply in doubt to Clark and the Stimson too, for that matter. After D-Day in 1944, Stimson gave Clark a final assignment. Quote, what you should do, he told him, I believe, is go home and try to figure out a way to stop the next war and all future wars. Think of what war will be in 25 years. It is intolerable. It was with his realistic sense that what would be necessary to defend the United States and its allies that Clark began to propose UN reforms that would inaugurate the rule of world law. It led to the Dublin Conference of October 1945 to deal with the threat of atomic bombs, to his plan for peace in 1950 on a general East-West settlement, and then, after apparent defeat of World Federalist bills in the Cold War, to world peace through world law in 1958 and in two later editions in 1961 and 1966. It is often said that the world federalists of the 1940s were foolish idealists. Clark shows the opposite. They were actually rooted in American constitutionalism and rule of law, complemented by the new doctrine of realism politics as the struggle for power, especially military power. Realism was brought to America by European historians and scholars of sovereign states in flight from Adolf Hitler. They meant only to guide America as she took her place in the international order or disorder from a long tradition of isolationism. Examples, Hans Morgenthau of the University of Chicago Carl J. Friedrich of Harvard, Frederick Law Schumann of Williams, Nicholas Spikeman of Yale, and Brooks Emeny in Cleveland. E. H. Carr remained in Britain. Morgenthau wrote in Politics Among Nations, 1948, quote, our analysis of the problem of domestic peace has shown that the argument of the advocates of the world state is unanswerable. There can be no permanent international peace without a state coextensive co with the confines of the political world." Unquote. Schumann wrote a serious book on world government and Spikeman at Yale taught Cord Meyer who became first president of 
United World Federalists. Meyer was typical of this fusion of Americanism and realism. He refused on a Pacific battlefield to believe that wars are inevitable and that power cannot be contained by law. So did Clark. World Federalists who's, who say, World Federalists say that they who wish to extend the rule of law are the realists, while those who put their faith in a league of sovereign states, or worse, who suppose that peace can long be maintained by deterrence or competition in arms are the utopians. People forget that disarmament, which Clark and Sohn championed, had once been proclaimed as high policy of the United States. In the Atlantic Charter of Franklin D. Roosevelt and Winston Churchill in August 1941, the eighth and climactic article read, quote, all of the nations of the world for realistic as well as spiritual reasons must come to the abandonment of the use of force. Since no future peace can be maintained if land, sea, or air armaments continue to be employed by nations which threaten or may threaten aggression outside of their frontiers, we believe pending the establishment of a wider and permanent system of general security that the disarmament of such nations is essential. We will likewise aid and encourage all other practical measures which will lighten for peace-loving peoples the crushing burden of armaments." Unquote. The United Nations of 1945, that wider and permanent system of general security, did mention the goal of regulation of armaments, Article 26, and even possible disarmament, Article 47, but its weakness for how to achieve disarmament led to proposals like those of Clark and Sohn. They did not regard the Korean War of 1950 as a terminal event, making, marking the Cold War as a permanent feature of world politics. The containment policy they treated as a temporary expedient, pending the time when serious work could begin to establish the rule of world law, as in all well-organized states, they thought that progress could be made by a definite plan, a realistic plan that would engage the informed public and distracted policymakers. In 1951, Clark and Stone started working hard on their own revision of the charter, article by article with commentary. It was a comprehensive plan for general disarmament and for strengthening the United Nations to fill the resultant security vacuum. In effect, it was a proposal for systemic UN reform, even for limited world government, though they avoided the term. In 1953, they privately printed 3,000 copies of an elaborate draft, which was distributed around the world. It generated a surprising number of comments from many countries. It was studied at Harvard Law and in public discussion groups, which generated comments, 2,000 in all, from distinguished statesmen, lawyers, scholars, and average citizens from around the globe. A complete revision was then published in 1958 under the title of World Peace Through World Law. World Peace Through World Law made a substantial contribution to the movement for general and complete disarmament that flourished for the next few years. Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev came to the United States in 1959 and proposed to the United Nations a plan for general and complete disarmament, which would have included the new intercontinental ballistic missile, the ICBM. Britain made a similar proposal. Then on 18 Jan February, 1960, President Eisenhower's Secretary of State, Christian Herter, followed up these initiatives with an important address on US policy to the National Press Club. In response to this official initiative, Clark and Sohn hurried a second edition of their book through the press by April, when in November, 
John F. Kennedy was elected to the presidency, fresh winds began to blow through Washington. Clark was convinced that Kennedy understood the need for world order. JFK said he had read world peace through world law with approval and he would have provided the necessary leadership, especially in a second term. In the summer of 1961, the United States and the Soviet Union began bilateral negotiations on the subject of disarmament. Meeting in Washington, Moscow, and New York, John J. McCloy and Valerian A. Zorin produced on 20 September 1961, a historic agreement on the principles of general and complete disarmament. The text explicitly set out the military forces, bases, stockpiles, weapons, and expenses to be eliminated, the stages of implementation with compliance and verification procedures at every stage, the creation of an international disarmament organization with powers of inspection and control, not subject to a veto, and the creation of a UN peace force and of reliable procedures for the peaceful settlement of disputes. It was followed by American and Soviet draft treaties on general disarmament in 1962. The US Arms Control and Disarmament Agency was established in this period in 1961. What happened to the McCloy Zorin Agreement? From a World Federalist perspective, the insecurities and nationalist traditions of a world without order overwhelmed it. The Cuban Missile Crisis, the assassination of Kennedy, the Vietnam War drove it out of mind. In response to the disappointment with disarmament, the Minuteman ICBM was rapidly deployed. By the early 1960s, scholarly comment was beginning to form a negative on world peace through world law. Herman Kahn on thermonuclear war set the tone. Work like Clark and Sohn simply was not being read in the defense establishment, he wrote. UN reform was no longer a policy option. Deterrence was the doctrine of the day. As far as I know, the only other influence of Clark and Sohn has been the expression of the ultimate objective, general and complete disarmament under effective international law. Which is under effective international control, which was inserted in the Non-Proliferation Treaty of 1968 and reaffirmed in several five-year review conferences. Effective international control has always seemed to me to be a relic of the old dreams of limited world government. I no longer find it in contemporary literature. I would like to conclude with a reflection on the conditions necessary for any renewed disarmament plan. The most difficult stage of the Clark Zone plan was a 10 year carefully guarded process of actually abolishing the military stockpiles, bases, laboratories, training camps, officer schools, and the like, and retiring millions of career soldiers and sailors. The process was to be supervised by an inspection commission and the 17 member UN Executive Council on which all the big powers would be represented. The 623 representative General Assembly would provide the ultimate legal authority, especially for adjustments in the stages of disarmament. No stage over the 10 years could be completed until all of the states had complied. Provision was made for six month postponements. The most difficult issue was how to resist national attack upon the reformed UN. For that, the 500,000 man individually recruited peace force would be necessary. Now, why should we believe that such a process 
leading to a monopoly of force in new UN agencies would ever be acceptable to the currently organized states of the globe. As Ronald Reagan once said, states do not fear each other because they are armed. They are armed because they fear each other. I answered based on my experience as a soldier, a historian, a student and teacher of international relations and a convinced world federalist. States would accept such an effective United Nations if their officials were convinced that a popularly representative UN General Assembly could be trusted to provide for the common defense and secure the blessings of liberty to the people. Historically, people said in 1945 as in 1961 that world community had not developed so far as to support a world government. But if even small steps of UN reform, like a second chamber of the General Assembly representative of people could be put into practice, as in the European Parliament, states would learn that a more popular assembly could be trusted to provide security as well as justice. And every step toward global government would help to create the community of humanity as the growth of the American Union shows. But the opportunity for disarmament seems lost now. The ICBMs have been fully deployed and nations have never been so fully armed. The US Arms Control and Disarmament Agency was closed down in 1999. The disarmament treaties that ended the Cold War, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces INF Treaty and the Conventional Forces Treaty in Europe, CFE Treaty have been abandoned. The Strategic Reduction Treaty, START III, is due for renewal in 2026, but may also be abandoned. The US Space Force has begun the militarization of outer space. We are for practical purposes now at war with Russia over Putin's aggression against Ukraine. Arms sent to Ukraine for the purpose of killing Russians involves the United States in the war. War with China over Taiwan is constantly threatened. And there's North Korea with ICBMs that can reach the United States. The Biden administration is determined not to lose the struggle between the democracies and autocracies. Domestically, the Republicans and the Trump forces threatened American democracy. It is possible that as during the Cold War, the states members will remain in the United Nations for it is all that survives of the organization of the peace against aggression. But the UN is failing as the guarantor of the peace. The UN could simply be abandoned like the League of Nations. The big five veto is not the main problem. It is the absence of popular representation in the General Assembly. We are, in my judgment, headed for a massive US upheaval over our democracy and a world crisis as war with the autocracies spreads. Appearances are like those at the beginning of the Vietnam War. I think that economic globalization has been set back by 75 years and the integration of humanity <clears throat> by global reform projects like those of Citizens for Global Solutions will be broken and overwhelmed by the coming catastrophe. You will have to operate in the midst of a massive domestic and international crisis. Only if the peoples of the globe become so convinced of the folly of such a war they demand that their leaders undertake disarmament under effective international control, as in the Clark Zone plan. Disarmament will be the work of an aroused humanity, not the states. Good evening.
Thank you very much, Dr. Barada, for a very educational and thought-provoking presentation. Um, at this point, we'll now turn to um, asking the qu questions that have been put in the chat. Um, I ask anyone ha else have any additional questions to please put them in the chat, remembering to start them with a question mark. If we don't get to all the questions now, uh, Dr. Barada has agreed to stay uh, for the breakout sessions at the end of today's program, where you'll have an additional 30 minutes to speak with him inform more informally. So without any further ado, we have a, a list of questions. I'll get started. The first one, under the Clark Zone proposal, how would the UN deal with issues that, were, that they were not aware of at the time, such as climate change? Uh, the question is, uh, what about other problems then? Uh, yes, how would they deal with climate change or as an example of an issue? Is is there? Is, uh, the answer, strictly speaking, is uh, that would be postponed. Parkinson thought the first task was to, was to uh, disarm the state so they would not continue to threaten each other and occasionally use forces uh, and inaugurate war. Um, all those larger problems like uh, addressing climate change or the enforcement of human rights um, or economic development, those belonged to the field of justice and uh, all that Clark and Stone could uh, uh, propose was to, uh, to um, amend the charter as, it, as the United Nations proved safe and, and trustworthy. Um, so this was a minimal plan, you must understand. And uh, it was enough to uh, uh, try to abolish uh, war than to undertake all the massive problems of global justice. I know that's disappointing to you, but remember, this is a practical plan. It's a step. It's not the whole plan. Okay, thank you. That's very clear. Um, another question, what would the World Peace Force do? Would world laws be binding on individuals? Oh, yes. Uh, and individuals could be um, <clears throat> apprehended and uh, brought to trial in new world courts, um, national courts, regional courts, and uh, the uh, uh, World uh, Equity Tribunal, uh, particularly. Um, and uh, and um, and they could, uh, if found guilty by due process of law, they could be punished. Um, it was understood to be exactly as in domestic uh, legal systems. Um, the great um, improvement of, of, is that the law could operate on individuals rather than whole states. And uh, normal police powers would be sufficient to bring those accused of violation of the laws to a trial um, without having to organize uh, basically international war against whole states as at present. This is a very important principle and people often uh, omit to speak of uh, enforcement of law upon individuals. Um, but indeed, uh, this is exactly what is contemplated and it would, re it would reduce the level of force necessary to maintain order to the, to the levels of police acting upon individuals. Um, this seems scary to people, but it's exactly the system found in every national state. Um, and the alter, alternative is to wage, wage international war upon whole states. Um, I'll give you a good example. And this was the Persian Gulf War of 1990-91, which was uh, actually uh, one of the two cases when the United Nations a charter actually worked as designed in a, to meet the aggression of Iraq against Kuwait by uh, the whole world. Uh, I think there were 32 states in the coalition and, there, um, and they put a stop to that. But that's a very uh, gross uh, exercise of force compared to uh, the rule of law through uh, proper courts. 
I, I think there's another question here related to this enforceability issue. The question is, how, how are testy parties obliged to solve an intolerable situation, such as the one we see now in Israel and Palestine? How, how would uh, compliance be guaranteed? Uh, are you, are you, did I hear you say that, uh, for example, um, in some great um, international problem, like uh, say the, the uh, Israeli-Palestinian problem? Yes. How, 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 how would enforcement be, be, uh, be uh, guaranteed? Consider what uh, Clark and Son proposed. Um, they proposed two new institutions, a World Conciliation Board and a World Equity Tribunal. The Conciliation Board would basically just be an investigatory body and would make a recommendation um, rather as, it, as at present by the General Assembly. But the tribe, um, but the uh, equity tribunal would have would go back to very large majorities in the general assembly. Would if the very problem could be undertaken, I think. What did I say? By a um, a, a vote of the general assembly of two thirds was it? And then if there was a recommendation for a settlement, if four fifths of the general assembly agreed with the World Equity Tribunal, that would be such an, a massive uh, ex demonstration of public will in the world community that it would be difficult for a recalcitrant state to resist. It could, of course, um, one state against uh, four fifths of humanity um, this would be very embarrassing to do, but uh, it could happen. And so it was provided that um, this, <clears throat> the uh, United Nations would need an independent peace force, individually recruited and capable, capable of meeting a, 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 a defiant state in battle. Um, uh, I you know, actually, there's another question on the same point. Would the World Peace Force be something like the FBI, or would it actually be a military force? A military force. A military force. Okay, thank you. Yeah, investigatory uh, powers are presupposed here, um, but what is needed is a is a military force to meet a challenger from some nation that refuses to abide by, say, a, a four-fifths uh, majority in uh, the, the newly elect, the elected General Assembly. Thank you, that's clear. Um, would the executive body contain the same nation as the Security Council today, or would there be some way to rotate them or change them? Um, gee, that's a technical question. I, I um, as I understand, uh, I, um, as I recall, the um, you see the Security Council would be replaced by the Executive Council, um, and it, and the great the current uh, Big Five are not necessarily going to be uh, represented there, but because they have large populations like the United States and and China and. Um, and Russia, why um, they would deserve a place in the Executive Council because of their large populations. Um, I don't think you'd have in the Executive Council um, anything more than rotating small powers. But the big powers, the ones that are populous and um, well-established would uh, necessarily by their numbers uh, be represented in the Executive Council. I think it was going to be 17 members. The present UN is um, Security Council is 15. 
Um, but the, the present uh, situation is that the big five are guaranteed a seat. Um, whereas uh, under the Clark's own plan, they would uh, deserve a seat by, me, be, by virtue of their national populations. Another question for you. How much do you think the move to deterrence was a result of the military industrial complex, um, the cor corporate profit motive? Uh, say that again. Well, the, uh, how much do you think uh, the move to de the question reads, what do you, how much do you think the move to deterrence was a result of the military industrial complex? Nuclear um, deterrent? Yeah, I, I think maybe the question means why, I mean, to me, it's why why didn't that happen? Was it, why were they unable to deter and, and eliminate weapons? Was it because the military industrial complex, the corporate profit motive was too strong? Did that, um, why well, do you, you think deterrence didn't work? Oh. Bob, it was Bob's question, maybe. Oh, I got it right. Do I have it right, Bob? Yeah, okay. It was, but yeah, that's it. It was the fact that they couldn't move to deterrence. Was it because of the corporate power, the profit power of the military industrial complex? Well, you know what deterrence is, don't, uh, Donna? Deterrence is simply fear that is cultivated in a putative enemy. Um, <clears throat> and that's developed... Um, as early as 1945, um, uh, it was thought that uh, atomic power would uh, overawe any challenger to uh, the United States. Um, there were even proposals to wage atomic war on Russia uh, by 1947. Um, and let, so let me restate the question, if I may. Yes, it's your question. Yeah. Go ahead, so Bob. Joseph, it looked like things were going in a very optimistic direction. We were going toward um, demilitarization, denuclear weapons, all that stuff. And all of a sudden you said, you know, at, uh, at a la about Herman Kahn's time, it turned into deterrence when we have to build up nuclear stockpiles and move in the opposite direction. So I was wondering, was, was that because of political thinking, military thinking, or did the military industrial complex come in and realize they're just gonna make more money um, by selling weapons and all, and they encouraged that shift? That was the question, thank you. I really think it was political rather than ec economic, Bob, uh, but it was very convenient for the military industrial complex. They made a lot of money and uh, <clears throat> these weapons are expensive and the, deploying them in fields in South Dakota where I come from, or uh was a was good business uh but i don't think you could blame the military industrial complex for um um uh, for a, a self-serving project to make a to make profits um it happened because of uh, historical uh, disputes between the united states and the soviet union uh, from the immediate, um, in the immediate post-war period. Great, thank you, thank you. Another question is, uh, someone is a bit confused about the mix of world law binding on individuals and having a military force that could move against states. Can you clear up that confusion? Well, you mustn't think that Clark and Sohn imagined that their proposed world peace force, which was to be quite sizable. In fact, it would even have to have uh, uh, access to nuclear weapons uh, taken away from the states. Um, this peace force was going to be the enforcer of the laws. This is completely wrong. Uh, what is proposed is that there should be a, a judicial system built up um, uh, to do the enforcing that police powers would be sufficient to apprehend individuals accused of violating the laws and they could be brought they could be brought into courts uh, not unlike the system uh, 
that we have now with the International Criminal Court. Um, uh, and they could then be um, charged and uh, do, and uh, the uh, accused would, would have their full rights to defense of themselves. A rational process in the court would determine their guilt or innocence. Um, only when they were found guilty would they be, would they be punished. And this would be by, <clears throat> by the instruments of, um, of punishment in accordance with civilized standards these days. Uh, probably no capital punishment would even be permitted, but the imprisonment might be permitted. But the, the peace force is just, <clears throat> is not the instrument of, of uh, enforcement of the laws upon individuals, not at all. Um, it is an ultimate, uh, an ultimate power that would have to be lodged in the common government of the world. It's true, but uh, I, um, I think it would, uh, uh, after the initial challenges, um, I think it would develop into a very small uh, kind of a reserve force available to the the common institutions uh, for an ultimate challenge, but uh, would only be a last resort. It's just the way with the United States operates. As you know, the United States government uh, alone is allowed to raise an army and a navy. Uh, the, it's very rare. It has happened though. It's very rare that there's a challenge to the you know, federal government and, and uh, the army must be deployed as, as in say the Little Rock uh, integration crisis. Um, um, of course, the American Civil War is a great instance where, where the Union was actually threatened. Um, and uh, uh, the Union armies became larger than, uh, than any American army until uh, up to uh, World War I. I think we have time for one last question um, from our friend, Tad Daly. Um, he thanked you for your, your terrific illumination of the history as usual. And uh, he has never heard the, although he's very knowledgeable about the Clark Sun and the Chicago committee preparing a draft of a constitution, he's never heard before this described as a minimalist versus maximalist um, example. But his question is, do you yourself think that Clark's son has value despite its minimalistic character? Well, I'm um, glad that question has come up, I must say. <laughs> uh, thank you, Tad. Um, uh, the way I put the question is, um, um, uh, today, almost everybody thinks that the problems besetting humanity are far greater than the, uh, the nuclear threat. There's all this, there's all this environmental degradation and this, is, this uh, threat to uh, human rights everywhere and economic poverty. And what um, almost all federalists and internationalists, I think are maximalists. They, they uh, nobody thinks that just eliminating nuclear weapons or, and even uh, conventional weapons, if we did both, uh, is sufficient to solve our problems. So doesn't that mean that a minimalist approach is, is uh, no longer instructive? And my answer is <clears throat> that we may be uh, defeating ourselves by our, by our maximal demands. Uh, it, um, it would be, it would still be very prudent to have a rather targeted small reform proposed to eliminate arms uh, and the threat of war waged by sovereign states in order to gain time for um, uh, before uh, addressing these larger problems. So in retrospect, I must say just if, 
as a speaker on the Clark's own plan, I, I actually think that it might be more, more useful to us to pursue return to this struggle for uh, systemic disarmament under the United Nations. It would, it would draw attention to the larger problems because we see uh, those problems as being conditional upon the solving the, the minimal one. In short, we should aim to abolish war and gain time for moral ideas to take root. Excellent. Thank you very much. Our time, our time is now up. Um, we're going to um, thank you. Everyone joined me in thanking Dr. Barada for a really interesting and thought-provoking, and it's a great way to end it with Tad's great question. Thank you, Tad.